Father, we're thankful to you for your word. Um, how absolutely lost we would be without you revealing yourself and uh, your designs and purposes and uh, telling us, giving us a mirror that we can look into so we can see what we're like. So we thank you for your scriptures and we pray that you would now uh, continue to use your word to help us understand you and who you are and what you're like as we try to wrestle with this uh, topic about pain and suffering and how to walk through that in a way that, that is both, both honoring and glorifying to you and is also helpful to us. We pray for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'd like to make one clarification and change a word in a, in a, a sentence in the sermon. And that is to say, in, instead of saying, reject your experience for what the scripture says, I'd like to say, evaluate or um, interpret. Because you can't just suddenly say, you know, there's, if you're familiar with the movie Emma, there's a, there's a gal in the movie who's falling in love with one guy and then he doesn't want to marry her and so she falls in love with someone else. And Emma's advice to her as she wrestles and struggles with this is just put him out of your mind. Just don't think about him. And she says, okay, I've done it. There we go. He's gone. I'm not going to think about him anymore. And then Emma suggests that they do something. I don't know. They look at puppies and hold up the puppy. And she says, oh, Mr. Elton had brown eyes. You know, so it's, you, you, can't, you can't just say, well, I didn't have the experience. And that wasn't what I tried to communicate. But that's what the word reject communicates. So um, let's say evaluate or what was the other word? Interpret. Interpret your, um, your experiences and Psalm 73 would be the text to go to for to back up that point. As the son, the son of as Asaph looks around him and, and he has the exp, what experience of wicked people prospering and righteous people suffering. And then he says, based on what I've experienced in life, uh, it doesn't do any good to pursue righteousness. And then he went into the sanctuary. And God showed him the end of the unrighteous or of the wicked. And so, then, so he interpreted his experience through the lens of Scripture and came out with a right result. That would be a much better way to think about that. Okay, So since you were here to hear that, you got the better message in two minutes. So let's think about the suffering of God. We were finishing with this last week, thinking about suffering that is at times... It's, it's the just result of, um, or that falls on a sinful, broken world. Sometimes, though, it's not proportionately metered out, if you will, to people. Sometimes suffering then, in that sense, is unjust. You, know, you, don't deserve, you didn't do something to deserve this suffering or that suffering. Um, or sometimes the degree of suffering is not proportionate with the way we've lived. That's the reality of living in a fallen world. And those things help us to not be um, either prideful and also keeps us from being bitter about our suffering or our situation. Um, another thing that we talked about last week is the sovereignty of God and that He is transcendent and He's ruling over every circumstance in life. And so that gives us comfort, but then it can also be, it needs to be balanced with the fact that God is a sufferer. Now, in just saying that sentence, I open up a whole can of theological worms that can lead us to all kinds of challenges and difficulties. And I'm not going to try to, um, to corral all of those worms today, but I am going to try to corral that concept a little bit so that we think rightly about God. And, and along the way, I'll, I'll try to encourage you with the why that this is important. Um, here's just the reminder from Isaiah 43, too, of, of God's nearness to us in the midst of suffering and difficulty that he's connected to his people and so it's because of that truth that we can say that that God suffers um, and I want to try to today to give a, some cautions and things that we can remember as we think about God being one who suffers there are some cautions that will keep us on the on a 
an appropriate path or a way of thinking about that. And that's kind of what we want to think about primarily this morning. So here are some cautions to remember. First of all, we're prone to make God human. And um, that's because the Bible talks about Him in human terms sometimes. And it's also because we're, we're idolaters. We're always creating, we can be creating a, an image of God in our own mind that's not consistent with Scripture. And the way we want God to be is like us, generally. We want Him to have some of the same tendencies and be shaped like us. And, and that makes life just more comfortable and easy. But the Scripture reminds us that God is not like us. Psalm chapter 50, verse 21, These things you have done, and I have been silent. You thought that I was one like yourself, but now I rebuke you and lay the charge before you. So there's the, the clear and strong reminder from Scripture that, that God is not like us. His ways, Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, are not like ours. My thoughts are not your thoughts, says God, neither are your ways my ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. We're going to go to lots and lots of scripture texts today, so I'm not going to ask you to go and turn to a text and look at that in your Bibles, and and I'm not going to ask you to play Bible drill. I'll, I'll just put them before you on the screen. So the Bible uses terms like that, that we call you know, the fancy word anthropomorphisms. Um, we need some kind of language because God is so much greater than we are. He condescends to use language like he stretches out his arm or his ears are not dull that he can't hear um, or that God walks among his people and things like that. The Bible uses language like that not so that we'll picture God with hands and eyes and ears and arms and feet, but just so that it can use language we can somehow relate to. So God bends down to us and uses that kind of language so we can can have some kind of understanding of Him. You know, we talked about last week how in His sovereignty and His majesty, how He is so other than us, and He is so other than us that we could not relate to Him at all except that He bends to us in these kinds of ways. Um, The Scripture also uses what uh, theologians call anthropo... What's the one about feelings? How do you say that word? Anthropopathisms. Yeah, I think that's how you say that word, which is could be a new one. Um, I, haven't, I haven't figured out how to say teleologically in this study yet for Brandon, but I, I did anthropopath... God feels, he gets angry. The, the, it describes God having emotions. And yet, we want to be cautioned in that God is not like us in those things. And so we need, again, to interpret our understanding of God through the Scriptures. Let the Scriptures shape that, uh, those things. So this may sound a lot like the sermon. And then a, a final thing is that we just simply cannot fully understand the mind of God. And that may be like one of those duh statements to you. And yet, that's the basis from which we tend to argue sometimes because this doesn't make sense to me it doesn't make sense you know it's it's kind of like children at home when i say to my children let's jump in the car and go to dairy queen they jump in the car and i you know, it's just a beautiful thing. And sometimes I take a video of it and post it on YouTube and say, look what obedient children I have. Right? No. That's not obedience. That's agreement. <laughs> it's when I say, let's get in the car and go do this task or get up and go to school or put your clothes on and go mow the grass. And they go to, that's then obedience when they do that, or submission. And then sometimes they'll say, why? And then sometimes, that, that's them saying, until this makes sense to me, I'm not going to agree with you. I'm, until it makes sense in my understanding, and I can work this into my whole uh, view of, of the world, then I don't, I don't buy this. Now, 
if our children do that with us, how much more then are we prone to do that with God, whose mind and ways are so much higher than us, and, and until we, we can go, oh, okay, well, I see why you want me to do this, or I, I understand this suffering, I can see where this is going, I'm, I'm on board with you, God, I can do that. That's how we tend to do, and that's what we're trying to fight here. Does that make sense? Okay. So in Exodus chapter 32, this is, is kind of, I'm using this as an illustration of an emotion, if you will, of God, and we're going to kind of wrestle with this and the, the struggles that it presents for us. Exodus 32, verses 10 and 11. Now therefore, let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them in order that I may make a great nation of you. This is God speaking to Moses. But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Now, in, in that situation... There are, are several different kinds of things going on. And it looks like, you know, the best illustration I can get of this in, in terms of getting right to the human thing, it, it looks like me getting mad at a basketball game and deciding I'm going to let my wrath burn against that other team member or that person who did something to me. And so I'm about to go after them and my teammates are holding me back saying, but no, Paul, don't go, don't go attack that guy. Don't let your wrath burn hot against the opponent because there's, there's something bigger going on here than you know. That's kind of what you might tend to think about this. You see Moses holding God's arms back and saying, no, God, don't go burn your wrath on, on the people. And it sounds like those kinds of things are going on. What are we supposed to do with that? Well, there are a couple of things that are happening here that are, are pretty clear. First of all, the text cannot be understood in a literally wooden way. And I've tried, I copied some of this stuff straight from a guy whose name I couldn't find. So I, God give him credit, okay, wherever he is. You can't look at this text, and, and as much as we desire to say, you know, we believe every word of God is inspired and divine and authoritative, you can't interpret it in a wooden way, which is what you would have to, if you're going to do that, you would have to picture Moses and God like I described him a minute ago. God saying, God kind of having a temper tantrum and saying, well, I've just had enough with these people. I'm going to go tear them up. And Moses holding him back. Moses being the one of reason and God out of control. If you interpret it in a literally wooden way, that's what you would have to picture. But here's what the scripture says, and here's a hermeneutical principle for you, okay? Hermeneutical meaning you, the, the way you interpret scripture or the, the, the tools you bring to your study of God's word and how you understand a text. Um, let clearer scripture interpret the more difficult passages that's the principle and that's absolutely free i'm not going to charge you for that today okay it's not going to be on the screen but when we come to a difficult text go find clearer texts that will shine light on that so here are some texts that do that james chapter 1 verse 17 tells us that there's no variation in god remember we sing great is thy faithfulness O god my father there is no shadow of what? Turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. So the hymn is communicating the theological truth that there's no variation in God. It doesn't change. It doesn't adjust. He doesn't become more of anything that he already is or less than in some area. He does not waver. Deuteronomy 4.31. He doesn't... Um, make a covenant and then go, oh, man, I wish I hadn't assigned that. It just doesn't do that. It doesn't come up to the, the point of, of it costing something and, and back away. He doesn't change his mind. Numbers chapter 23, verse 19. He doesn't say, oh, this is what I was going to do to you, but eh, I think I'll do it this way. It's like the thing that drives our kids crazy sometimes when we change our minds about things. So with all that understood, though, the text does mean something, doesn't it? 
which is I'm, I'm thankful for that reminder during the interlude uh, between preaching and Bible study. The experience does mean something, doesn't it? And something's going on there, and that's what we're saying here. And the first thing that it means, or the, I guess the primary thing that I think those texts, those kinds of texts mean when, when God is angry about sin or God is compassionate or when He grieves or when He is sorrowful, it means that He's not uninvolved with His people. Even though He's this transcendent, other than holy, completely separate God, God too far above us, His thoughts and His ways far away from us, even though He is that God, He is also not uninvolved. And so boys and girls, when you all hear us talking about God, and you're still having a, a hard time even just getting your sense and your mind around this, this whole idea of trusting a God you can't see, let this be a comfort and an encouragement to you. God is not, although God is all those things, massively set among us and, and completely different from us and, and we don't have his same thoughts or his ways or anything. There's nothing about us that's, that's precisely like him, yet he is also close. He is near to us. So he is transcendent, he is higher and other than us altogether, but he is imminent. That means he is near or he's connected and he's involved. Okay, let me stop there and see. We got questions or comments or anything that needs to be clarified? Or have I, have I said anything like reject when I should have said interpret? Am I doing good? Okay. That you can interpret text in a woodenly literal way, yes. I mean, what, what you got? Yeah. Yeah. That he can change. That God can change. <laughs> can he these feelings, right? What does it mean that God feels, right? And you say, well, in some sense, that's anthropomorphic. We talk as if it's analogy. We feel things, and there's something like that that God feels. Yeah. Yeah, so that's that theological can of worms that's a really difficult concept to talk about God's impassibility or that he doesn't have passions. When you turn around and read in the scripture, and the Lord said to Moses, this is a stiff-necked people, let me alone that my wrath may wax hot against them. And that sounds like God got mad, doesn't it? So we're, we're talking about is, is God... Uh, does does God have passions? And the I'm sorry. No, go ahead. It's really okay. Okay. Well, later. All right. In the the short answer is no, He doesn't. Because for this reason, because we tend to think about that like I've been describing it all morning, like God has mood swings, like we do or that he becomes something that he was not, becomes angry when he was not. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more as we press along here. That's what that word historically meant. We use passions differently now. Yeah. We mean he is without moods. Right. And one of the, Stan and I were driving along the, the other day, Thursday, trying to talk about this. I said, how, am I, how in the world am I going to explain this? How do you work through this? And I think it's hard, and I'll go back to, We simply cannot fully understand the mind of God. and that's, I'm not bailing on that. I'm saying, you know, if I could perfectly explain the mind of God to you, I would be Him. And I know I'm not. So, we're saying that... Um, well, let me kind of press along here, and I think that it'll help. I'll, we'll keep talking about this. Just do a do a quick note check here. Okay, so we learned that we can't just interpret that woodenly. Am I in the right place? Do you, you? Yeah. Some of these some of these slides were made at like midnight ish. <clears throat> So I'm sorry, give me just one second. 
when I say that God doesn't stand apart from or uninvolved in His people, and we talk about this issue of, of passions and impassibility and so forth, I think that we can understand that from the perspective that men, or we can understand that concept from the perspective that men are the ones who change. That God always hated sin. It's just that as men sin against God, they experience the fact that He, he is angry about sin. So when Stan and I were driving along the road, we were, we were saying, so it's not that God suddenly becomes displeased with something. He is always displeased with obedience in the same way all the time for, from eternity past to eternity future. It's just that when people do something displeasing to Him, they taste or see or experience that displeasure. And I think that's an appropriate way to think about those things. So we're not saying that God does not have affections or that God is unmoved by either obedience or disobedience or by evil or the things that are going on in His creation. But we're saying that God is all those things all the time at the same time in the same way. And they just are experienced in different times based on things that, are, that we are doing. People change, God does not. And the Bible's trying to communicate something to us that we can't get apart from these kinds of condescending terms. Now, for those who are sitting here going, you know what, I just don't care. <laughs> that has nothing to do with, with what's going on in my life right now. But it does. Because the reason this is important is that if God can change, you cannot trust Him. And if God swings around and mood swings and things, if God has temper tantrums, you cannot trust Him. He is of no comfort or help to you in the midst of your suffering or sorrow. You need to know that there is a God who, even though He seems to be presented in the Scripture as one who is changing, He does not. And He is always the same yesterday, today, and forever. And God can be trusted to do what is right because he is always right. So when we say that God is a suffering God, we're not implying that he has mood swings, that he shifts or changes in any way. We are saying that he is a transcendent God who is personally connected with his people. And that's the help in sorrow that we need. To know that we're not... If, that if we embrace this transcendent God, we're not saying he is somehow just a cruel king sitting on a throne and going, well, that's what you get. It's not like that. He is engaged with us. And His affections, as they relate to us, are not involuntary. They are always there and they are intentional. Yes, yeah, coming. I just realized I had a lot of notes in between this and the, the incarnation. Um, this is the danger of open theism which is pretty popular today, where people read texts of Scripture that say God saw all the evil that men had done and was sorry. You know, they're just saying there's nowhere you can go except to say that God changes or that God's open to what happens or that He reacts to things that are going on. And the, the place that I'm trying to give you that, that is, is a, a foundation of comfort is that God does not react. His, his passions, if you will, are not involuntary like mine are. When, when one of my kids does something, I react to that, I respond. And, and those are passions, but God has affections, if you will. We can make that distinction, maybe that way, that are not involuntary. He cannot be made, one author says, to emote against His will or to have an emotion that He didn't plan to have or was already having. Okay? Um, let me just read this paragraph to you because it's well said. And, and again, this is the guy whose name I couldn't find. Um, God is not a metaphysical iceberg, which is what we tend to make him out to be if we, we give him all this power and omniscience and glory and majesty and transcendence, then he's also cold and indifferent. He is not a metaphysical iceberg. While he is never at the mercy of his creatures, neither is he detached from them. His wrath against sin is real and powerful. His compassion for sinners is also sincere and indefatigable. That's a great word, indefatigable. It's what none of us are when it comes to running. We get fatigued by the demand of running. 
We get fatigued when we don't sleep. We get fatigued when we're lifting weights. We get fatigued when we do homework and try to write a paper for a long time. God is indefatigable. He never gets fatigued in showing compassion to sinners. He never gets fatigued in helping His people and being connected to us. Okay, let's see. His mercies are truly over all His works. And above all, His eternal love for His people is more real, more powerful, and more enduring than any earthly emotion that ever bore the label love. Unlike human love, God's love is unfailing, unwavering, and eternally constant. That fact alone ought to convince us that God's affections are not like human passions. And that's what we're talking about when we say God's impassable. That His affections are not like human emotions. Okay. And that's a source of comfort for you. <laughs> All right? Now, I'm not saying that you need to love that theological discussion, but I'm saying that, that you want to fight the feeling that God has changed His mind about you with those kinds of truths. Okay? Yes? Is it Philip Johnson? Okay, thank you. Yeah. That whole atonement thing, that whole forgiveness thing, that whole assurance that you're going to heaven one day, forget it. Forget it, yeah. Forget it. Changed my mind. Day, I could, he didn't know that I was going to be that bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's where you have to go with open theism. That's the logical conclusion. And there's no comfort in that. And, and in the... Well, I'm just saying, in the dark, you need good truth to argue with when the, when the evil one is throwing darts at your thinking and, and whispering things to you and accusing you. You need to be able to fight that with truth. I would say fully expressed, just not fully experienced. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I mean, think about when, when Moses said, God, show me your glory. And God said, well, you can't experience, you can't handle my glory. That doesn't mean God was somehow not being all glorious all the time at that point. But Moses couldn't experience it all. And so God gave him some taste or experience of his glory as he passed by. Um, and the glory and majesty of his presence, but Moses didn't fully experience that. So that's how big God is, that he can not... I'm sorry, I have these illustrations that pop in my head. You know, I, I have a dear friend who's... Um, anyway, um, let me do, not do that. That's how big God is, that he cannot crush us with his glory. He's so glorious. We, if, if the only way we could experience Him in, is in all of who He is, it would just obliterate us, I think. Like to try to get close to the sun. We don't experience all the, the power and the energy of the sun. We only, we, but it, it doesn't mean that, that it's not expressing all of its power and glory 93 million miles away. In the New Testament... The God-man, Jesus, experienced all we do in normal life. So he, he was weary, John chapter 4, verse 6. He was angry at things going on around him. Mark chapter 3, verse 5. He was grieved at the hardness of heart of people around him. He knew sorrow. Jesus wept, John eleven thirty five. He knew rejection from people. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplication with loud cries and tears. Oh, I'm sorry, again, this is an expression of sorrow. Uh, as he offers these to him who was able to save from death and was heard because of his reverence. So he, he worshipped. He interacted with God the Father. Um, he experienced rejection 
from family members and people around him. His brothers said to him, Leave here and go to Judea that your disciples also may see the works you are doing. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. So these brothers are kind of mocking him and, and saying, If you're really all that, well, go show off. Go do your thing. And I, I wonder if there was not some motive there to reap the benefit of having a, an awesomely famous brother, half-brother. Not even his brothers believed in him. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. So Jesus experienced in his flesh all of these situations. And, and the, the scripture tells us that he's tempted in all ways, even like we are. And so we, we know of, of God who has tasted these things. D.A. Carson says, The God on whom we rely knows what suffering is all about, not merely in the way that God knows everything, but by experience. That's an important statement to me, at least, because I, I can tend to, to, to think about, for instance, people who are really, really smart and, and make good grades in school. And I think, well, yeah, because you're super smart. Well, no, they're using all the gifts that God gave them, and they work really hard. They've gotten there. So God doesn't get here just because he knows everything, but he also enters into our suffering in the incarnation. And again, this is ground where I think we have to be careful, and there's some theological precision that's needed at this point. But I think what I, what I want us to get is that Jesus... God is not one who is unacquainted. He is a man acquainted with sorrows. And we don't ever want to say, God doesn't know or understand what's going on with me. Here in Acts chapter 9, we also see that even post-resurrection, Jesus enters into or experiences or tastes the suffering of His people as He says to Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So, there even post-resurrection and Jesus still in the flesh um, experience the, experiences these things. Before I, I should have, before I got to post-resurrection, there was something I wanted to read to you from uh, Keller's book. And this is an effort by Robert Murray McShane to understand the, the passion or the experience of Christ on the cross. As he reflects on Jesus' cry that God had forsaken him, McShane writes, He was without any comforts of God, no feeling that God loved him, no feeling that God pitied him, no feeling that God supported him. God was his son before, S-U-N, son before. Now that son became all darkness. He was without God. He was as if he had no God. All that God had been to him before was taken from him now. He was godless, deprived of his God. He had the feeling of the condemned when the judge says, Depart from me, ye cursed, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. He felt that God said the same to him. I feel like a little child casting a stone into some deep ravine in the mountainside and listening to hear its fall, but listening all in vain. This is the hell Christ suffered. The ocean of Christ's sufferings is unfathomable. He was forsaken in the place of sinners. If you close with Him as your surety or your confidence, you will never be forsaken. You will never hear or have to say, you'll never hear that God has departed from you. You'll never have to say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And so that's the, the effort to, under, to, to see the sufferings of Christ and also to see how it joins us to Him. Um, So now I'm leaping forward again. Post-resurrection, Christ is still connected with the sufferings of His people. And as a result, we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light and momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. So there's some sense in which our sufferings are... The Bible says when we suffer, we fill up what is lacking in the suffering of Christ. And that doesn't mean that, that there was something lacking in the atoning death of Christ. It means that as we suffer, we are, are 
connecting to Christ. We are experiencing what Christ has, has experienced. Um, and, and just as Jesus learned obedience through His suffering, and just as Jesus obtained the glory of God through the suffering of the cross, so we become more Christ-like through our sufferings as we share in, in the sufferings of Christ. So God is sovereign. If He's not in control of all things, then suffering is not a part of any plan. It is just random. God has suffered so we can trust Him. We cannot say that He does not understand our situation. We can't say that this is unique somehow. We cannot say He's cruel and unfeeling, that He has no affections. Because that's not true. The Bible tells us otherwise. And since He has chosen to enter into pain, we can trust Him. So that's the, re the reminder. Here's a, um, a quote from Elizabeth Elliot. If, if you don't know who Elizabeth Elliot was, she was a missionary to Aka Indians and then at a later point married Jim Elliot, who was also a missionary uh, to, to the Aka Indians, Quechua maybe more accurately. Um, Jim Elliot and five other men who made the very first contact with these Indians were killed one day uh, by those, those very people that they were trying to reach with the gospel. And sometime later, as someone, well, you know, people would interact with her, and she wrote in the epilogue of the book, uh, Through Gates of Splendor, which is a description of Jim Elliot's life. We know that time and again in the history of the Christian church, the blood of martyrs has been its seed. We are tempted to assume a simple equation here. Five men died. This will mean X number of Watrani Christians. Perhaps so. Perhaps not. God is God. I dethrone Him in my heart if I demand that He act in ways that satisfy my idea of justice. That's a really critical thing to hear. I dethrone God in my heart if I demand that He act in a way that's consistent or satisfies my idea of justice. And then hear this, it is the same spirit that taunted, if you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. There is unbelief, there is even rebellion in the attitude that says, God has no right to do this to five men unless, and then fill in the blank. Now I want you to think about how many times you may have heard people around you say, God, God why would God do that? That doesn't make sense to me. That doesn't satisfy what I understand to be justice. And then maybe if you're, if you, you're bold enough, <laughs> you know, if you're willing, think about how you may have even stumbled into that path sometimes. Going, well, I don't know if I can love a God who does this or that because it doesn't settle up with me in the way that I want it to. And so that, this is calling us away it's calling us to remember that God has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That He's come near to us in our suffering. That He's made a provision for us in His person. Uh, that He is ruling over those things. And, um, and so as we, as we get more and more Bible information about what it says about God, that helps us interpret and walk through our suffering more faithfully. And, uh, and can I use the word successfully? Maybe. I don't want to imply too much by that. Okay. Um, I'm going to read you to close um, this letter written by a woman named Andy. And I'll try to fast forward. Um, some to, to get you done by 12. I dropped to my knees when I got to the side of my bed. It was time to end the day, but I couldn't yet. The ring had to come off. It was time. That afternoon, a judge had declared my divorce final. Though the demise of our marriage had appeared inevitable for a while, I hadn't stopped wearing my wedding ring, a symbol of my confidence that no matter how hopeless things looked, God could turn them around in an instant. But now, here I was, Thirty years later, kneeling alone by the side of my bed. I sobbed, but it wasn't the sorrow. I dissolved as these images were eclipsed by an overwhelming awareness of God's faithfulness to me through it all. 
Never had I felt abandoned by him. Confused by his allowing life to be excruciatingly hard for so long when I knew he could restore? Yes. On the verge of complete mental, emotional, and physical collapse at times? Yes. Like I had lost my bearings spiritually? Yes. In fact, one night it had all come to a head and I experienced a true spiritual crisis. Where was this God I had been counting on? Was he real? If he was, did he care? I was in no shape to compose an articulate prayer. There was a lot of sobbing and groaning. When I could form words, I cried out, I could never watch someone I love suffer like this and not stop it. You say you love me, but I can't square that with what I see happening. This feels cruel. I've got to know you are who you are or I cannot go on. Now I think this is where that thing of not saying, you know, when I said in the sermon, reject your experience for what Scripture says, it would almost imply that I would say to this woman, quit your whining. And that is not what I meant to, to communicate. I was saying what she's trying to cry out to say, oh, I need help to interpret this. I need help to understand what's going on. She says, I didn't, know, I, I didn't need to know his reasons. I needed him. The next morning, wide word from a friend, a trusted friend came to me. Andy, you need to force feed yourself the scriptures. Through them, the Holy Spirit can speak to places in your heart where human words can't, just can't reach. And there's a whole bunch of counsel in that said deal. I needed to be uh, touched with that deeply. I, so the next morning, I opened my Bible. My eyes fell on the, these words in Psalms. You, O God, are strong, and you, O Lord, are loving. They came like smelling salts to my fainting heart, silencing torturous fear and doubt. My heart was infused with a deep assurance that he loved me and was very near. I was immediately steadied. It didn't matter anymore that I couldn't square this with what I was unfolding or what I saw unfolding in my life. Kneeling by my bed that night, my heart broke, unable to contain my gratitude for God's persistent love, though a mess that should have driven him away. Instead, he came closer than ever. As I slipped the ring off, a prayer poured from my heart. Now I want to give you the devotion I thought I would be giving to an earthly husband. You alone are worthy of my whole heart's trust, and it's yours for the rest of my life. And she went on to, to think, I'm going to get myself another ring to remind me of this vow that I've made to the Lord. The next morning, I met with a group of women with whom I had been meeting weekly for prayer. We never talked a lot about what we were going to pray for. We just prayed. During the time of silence with which I, we always began, I noticed one of them coming over and kneeling in front of my chair. She took a ring off her finger, held it out to me and said, I feel like the Lord wants you to have this ring. He wants you to know that you are His beloved, that He is betrothing Himself to you for the rest of your life. He will be your protector and provider. He will never leave you or forsake you. He will be with you forever. The ring she handed me was much more beautiful and valuable than any ring I would have gotten myself. I had... I had mentioned nothing about getting a new ring. I can't tell you how many times in the years since a glance at the ring it calmed my fear, filled my loneliness, and comforted my grief. I wanted a ring to remind me of my commitment to the Lord. Instead, I ended up with one that will forever remind me of His commitment to me. God is faithful. We don't always understand Him. He is, he is impossible to figure out. So, so then let's take what we can get and rest on that. Let's pray. Father, it's so scary to stand up and talk about you and try to, to communicate the things that are so complex. So I pray that your Holy Spirit will, throughout the morning, um, have, have communicated and, and helped us it helped us to know you a little better. And because we know you a little better, we are able to trust you and, uh, and walk in the midst of our pain and suffering and difficulty with you. I pray, too, that we would be um, encouraged as a people to love your word more. And God, help us to get over that hump between our knowledge and our experience. We all know lots of right things to do in life. We just don't always do them. And so as we, have, as we choose and use our time and energy and resources and we know that your word is a breath of life to us, 
as you open it up to us by your spirit, help us to spend time in it and study it and love it and, and understand it and follow it and, uh, and to enjoy you in the process. We ask for it in Christ's name. Amen.